Hello and welcome back to the Study Legal English podcast. I'm your host Louise and today, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a real treat because you're going to be hearing my interview with a woman who does incredible things with legal documents. That is Stefania Passera. She is one of the world's biggest legal design experts. Stefania is the co-creator alongside Helena Harpio of the World Commerce Contract Design Pattern Library, which is an incredible resource. I've mentioned it before in the show and we'll be talking about it today as well. And last year, quite rightly, very well deserved, Stefania was a winner of the Women in Legal Tech Award. Now, you might be thinking, Louise, why do I need to know about legal design? I'm a lawyer. Well, my friend, because what kind of legal documents are you producing? Are they really fit for the 21st century? Let's be honest about this. Because if your answer is no, well, there is another way. There's a fantastic way to transform your legal documents and you don't need to be Leonardo da Vinci to do that. Instead, you just need Stefania who's going to give you some hints and tips today about what legal design is and how it can help you. In this interview, we talk about what legal design is, what good and bad legal design is. We talk about information architecture. We also see examples from the best privacy policy in the world and as well a final example which is from a set of instructions to guide users through using contract terms. Now there are visuals to go with this. We do this as a video so if you're listening to the podcast then you might want to head over to YouTube to watch the video so that you can see these examples because of course you know we're talking about legal design here. Um, you might want to see it. The final example Stefania shows us, the visuals are in Finnish, so if you're a Finnish speaker then obviously that's going to help. Now before we get started with the interview I've got a question for you. How do you use legal design in your work? Let me know. Send me an email to louise at studylegalenglish.com or if you're watching on YouTube give a comment down below and of course you can also find me on social media on Instagram at Legal Englisher and Facebook just search for the Study Legal English group. So now let's listen to that interview. Hi Stefania how are you? Hi, hi Louise nice to be here. It's funny because I live in Finland but you're living in Italy usually and not too far from where I'm from. So you're from Varese, Vare, yes. Varese, which is close to Lecco, yeah, where I'm mostly, normally I'm, I'm in Lecco. <laughs> but now you're based in Finland. Is there anything that you miss from Italy? Um, better weather, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> More sunlight? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> so speaking to you, you absolutely don't have an Italian accent. Go. I have a weird accent, I guess. <laughs> People don't even figure out where I'm from. I probably caught some British accent by watching way too much, I don't know, Blackadder, Monty Python, stuff like that. Yeah. I still have a bit of Italian accent and probably have a lot of Finglish accent too. Yeah. I don't know, it's, it's a weird mix. Do you speak Finnish? Yeah, I speak Finnish. I'm a certified Finnish speaker. It's like one of the hardest languages in the world, apparently, for English speakers to learn, something like that. And, uh, and what do you love about Finland? Well, I decided to move to Finland to study design. I, I was really interested in Nordic design. And when I arrived here, I, I discovered that there were these classes with just 10 students. So it was really this sort of a continuous workshop, hands-on, flat hierarchy sort of education. Whereas in Italy, where I used to study at Politecnico di Milano, when we were in small classroom, we were 70 students and we, we were in plenary, we were over 200. So we we're mostly doing our work at home, then going to school, get a very quick revision, queuing most of the time to get the revision, then going back. So it, it was a lot of self-learning and uh, not enough feedback. Uh, I like the quick iteration, the continuous feedback in uh, Finnish education. 
So I think that after three months I was here, I said, I'm going to apply for a master. I'm not going to go back. I like it here. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. So let's get on into the questions. How did you get to where you are today? Oh, that's an interesting story. The sh very short answer would be by chance. <laughs> the slightly more elaborated story, I think I had the good, the good luck, like many people really, I think, to encounter Helena, who you mentioned before, Helena Hapio. She's an incredibly uh, acute thinker, jurist, and uh, innovator. So we just, we just met. M my boss at the university introduced me because I was working in a, in a research group that was dealing with innovation, making it, how we used to say, it, like making it magically easy to innovate and to systematically experiment with ideas, even the most abstract one. So um, as a side effect of that, we ended up knowing most of the most innovative people in Finland. And that's how I met Helena. And she was telling me that she's been working with a graphic facilitator for many years. Annika Varionen, who's been helping her during her contract training to visualize on the spot the, the, the concepts, the conversation. And she said how she was always amazed how much that would engage people and how much it would aid uh, sense making and alignment and this sort of things. And she said that her dream would be making the contracts themselves and not only contract training put that sort of smile and energy back into people. I remember she saying like, I love contracts. I, I really do. And I don't understand why other people don't. I do understand why they don't. But anyway, I told her what, what you described sounds to me like uh, information design. Have you ever heard information design? That's what I do. To be honest, I don't know anyone uh, in my profession who's been working with legal information. So it sounds like a crazy enough challenge. Shall, shall we try to do together something? So we started experimenting. We had the good luck of getting funding through the university. We were in this very large uh, research project for five years. It was basically a project to try to bring uh, user experience, customer experience, uh, usability, all these uh, sort of concepts and methods and uh, approaches into the heavy industries metal industry, in engineering industries in Finland. So it was this strategic cluster, the research consortium. And some companies in this cluster let us, uh, they gave us their contracts and said, okay, experiment. We were in the management um, work stream. It's like, okay, we're not going to design new interfaces for cranes, but we can try to redesign the contracts. So that's how our research what basically ended up being my PhD, that's how it started. Creating prototypes, testing them with people, measuring if people would understand, if it, they would be more accurate, if they would be faster. Then it kind of escalated <laughs> because I started measuring, okay, are you a lawyer? Are you a non-lawyer? How old are you? Uh, what's your cognitive style? Are you a verbalizer, a visualizer? And after years doing this sort of measuring, well, the only thing that really has a strong effect is the presence or not of this visualization. So if you take a, even a legalese document and you give it as is, so usual wall of text, or you try to have a decent layout, making the logical structure clear, and then using explanatory diagrams, then consistently people would understand better. Even if they were strong verbalizers, even if they were lawyers with third years of experience. Actually, the effect is stronger if you're a non-native speaker of the language, actually your answers, according to those tests, uh, they seem that their understanding was becoming as precise as the native speaker. So that's when I opened up a bottle of champagne in my doctoral career. It's like, yes, this has great managerial implication for, <laughs> for international business. This is publishable stuff. This is gold. <laughs> And that's how it started. I mean, I was just a boffing. I, I was just a nerd doing these things at university. And then I started getting calls from, from companies saying, we read all your papers. And it was like, this must be a joke because no one reads academic papers. Who are you? No, we are from companies such and such. We read all your papers. We want to do these things. How much does it cost? I was like, well, I guess I'm a consultant too now. By now, I've been in weekends. And that's how I, that's how I went on for a few years. And finally, after getting my PhD and I went to maternity leave, after that, I opened my own uh, consultancy. So that's where I am now, basically, 
It's wow. a sp- spin off of my research. Gosh, what a journey to where, where you are now. And yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people kind of say, oh, I kind of fell into this by chance. But I mean, really, you're just being, you're just too modest. <laughs> like it sounds like a lot of hard, a lot of hard work went into it. You clearly had a desire to work with design. You found yourself in the right place. But then ultimately, you're, you're very, very good at, at what you do. So well, when you're doing something innovative, you, you cannot plan new things into existence. So up to, up to a degree, it's always up to luck, chance, uh, stubbornness, or perhaps to, to kind of a desire to see things through, to say like, okay, how does it pan out if I really amp it up to to 11 like if I really go out there and try to do this thing what is going to be but yeah you cannot really plan it into existence you can only experiment with it and then just follow your inspirations I guess you're lucky if you get those inspirations like it was my case with uh, Helene and many other people to be honest yeah it must have been a really like amazing when you got calls from big companies who were like wow yeah we we want this And now, you know, you've worked with so many people and there's loads of examples of your work, but winning awards and everything on the internet. So for you, what what would you say, what is good contract design and what's bad contract design? So let's start from the bad. That's probably easy to imagine, especially if you're not a lawyer, if you're a stakeholder of a contract or a consumer subject to its terms that you cannot even (laughs) negotiate. Well, to me, bad contracts are contracts that are narrowly focused. So contracts that work only in court, contracts that work only for lawyers, contracts that are a legal tool, a legal instrument only to threaten and bludgeon the other party or to protect your own back. First, I think that we should look at the purpose of what a contract is. So why are we, why are we creating this contract? Conversely, what is a good contract? I, I think it's the opposite of that. It's holistic, it's uh, contextual, so it doesn't look at theory, but it looks at practice. It, it's a contract that, when it's created, asks very good questions. So what are we trying to achieve in this business transaction or in whatever transaction that is? It's a document, it's an it's a economic instrument, it's a business tool to make things happen. So it, it should be like instructions, really. I like to think of contracts that they shouldn't look like legal writing, but more like user guides or sets of instructions. And when I get to the point that I really feel that those contracts look more like a, some sort of instruction manuals or in user interviews, that sort of comment comes out, I know that my work is done. <laughs> and it's all, for all the stakeholders. I mean, when you are called in to simplify, make life easier like okay whose life I'm making easier of course it still needs to work for the lawyers it still needs to work from a compliance point of view but it needs to work for business it needs to work for the bottom line it needs to work for the counterparty because well the contract is a meeting of the mind so potentially it should enable both parties to achieve their goals and this is on a very theoretical level, I would say, if we want to make it simpler to discover the good and the bad, we should look at what the contract says and how it says it. So a friend of mine pointed out like, well, but why is that contract design? That's the definition of rhetoric. It's like, well, but contracts are communications. Contracts is business communication or human to human com- communication. It is what they are really. So yes, if we need to even look at design and rhetorics and communication and tone of voice, uh, I, I think it would be a welcome development. So in what it says, of course, it needs to be transaction appropriate. It needs to not to, you know, Goldilocks rule, not to overprotect and not underprotect for whatever you're trying to do. But it needs to also look at the bigger picture in, in, in terms of the business goals. So what is it that you're trying to really achieve with that? Plain language, of course, it needs to be intelligible. It needs to be concise. It needs to be 
easy, not only for the reader, but also for the people who are tasked perhaps to edit, redline it, the longer and more complex it is, it makes life miserable for everyone involved with it. And then of course, there's the how you say it. So the tone of voice, how you're going to frame certain topics. You know, you can have uh, options clause. You can frame that as, okay, if, if you don't perform, we're going to terminate the contract shorter. Or you can say like, hey, we have a trial period. And if we're happy, we're going to extend for another three years. So which one, which framing sounds better and more cooperative and help you focus less on punishment and more on performance? And yeah, so how it says it, like we, we need to ask who is going to read this, who's going to consume this information and to do what sort of tasks in what sort of environment. So we basically need to have that contextual knowledge to know how we should design the contract. The answer that a, a user researcher or a research-oriented designer would love to tell is that it depends. And it's true because it depends on the context. We're not very big believers in best practices, perhaps in best principles, but not in copy-paste best practices. I really liked that comment about framing, whether you're saying something in a positive way, like we have a trial period. If you're happy with it, you can extend it or something like that compared to if you do something wrong, we're going to terminate. <laughs> There's tons of research from this American professor, Libby Weber, on the psychological effects of framing in contract. I'm a big fangirl of her research. <laughs> I think that everyone who's in contract should read her, her research because it was really an eye opener uh, on the framing, um, looking at, at these things. I think it's very, very cool. <laughs> I've heard of framing within the context of negotiations, but I hadn't really thought about it even in the context of contracts. So that's a really good point. And yeah, you know, if you're coming from the perspective that this is about creating good business relations, then framing is a really important thing. And I'm sure that the actual design, when you're using icons and things, that's also part of the framing because it's like that, you know, if you've got a wall of text, it can look very uninviting, very hostile compared to something that's, you know, got some nice, it just looks nice. The human it brain takes around, I don't know how many few milliseconds when it sees a page or a document of any kind to make a decision if that is relevant for the reader or not. So <laughs> that's something that comes from human computer interaction, but we can easily use it for contracts if you see something that is this thick and uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages, every, everything in uh, font size, point nine, no visual cues as to what matters more, what matters less, no help to read it strategically. People are immediately going to form an impression that this is going to be misery. This is going to be very hard to read. This looks very serious, very boring, very hard. And given the choice, people wouldn't engage. Yeah. I've been just doing with a colleague extensive user research for a project recently. It was on consumer contracts, but we incidentally also interviewed lawyers and contract managers. So people who are paid in their professional life to read contracts. And even these people say like, yeah, I can skim read them. And, you know, based on my experience, I know where to look for risks, but no, I don't read consumer cons. Like, who reads them? No one reads them. They're, they're, they're non-reasonable. They're awful. No, no, no one has time for that. You, you can't negotiate them. Why would you read them? Even the pros literally have to be paid to read contracts as they mm. are now. <laughs> yeah. I also really liked your point about how you see contracts as a set of instructions. And that's a really nice way of putting it. These are instructions about how two or more parties are going to be working together, why not write them like instructions to make it very clear? Because I know that very often it's, it's difficult. Companies don't know what their obligations are in a badly drafted or a badly designed contract. And so this kind of layout that you're talking about is a really nice way to present it. So let's move on. Let's take a real example of something that you've worked on and talk through what you did. Now, listeners, there's actually going to be videos of this on YouTube. Go over to YouTube. If you search Study Legal English, you're going to find these videos. So let's look at an example. What example should we look at? Should we start from a 
classic juro, the aka the best privacy policy in the world, allegedly. <laughs> in the months before GDPR came out, Juro's CEO, Richard, maybe reached out to me. I was still on maternity leave, so you can imagine the mental confusion there. Like, we want to do the best privacy in the world. We, you know, GDPR is coming out. We don't want it to just be another exercise in compliance. We want to exceed the, you know, the entry level. We, we want to do something meaningful. You're supposed to communicate these things to really make them uh, transparent. We are uh, legal design fans. We would like to... To work with you to figure out what it could be. So, okay, what does it mean, the best privacy policy in the world for you? And then by reframing <laughs> this sort of brief, we figure out that the goal was that a privacy policy that people could actually read. So all the techniques that we've been using in this project are aimed to that. And I'm going to show you now. I mean, I'll mention that the privacy policy that we're looking at is amazing. I've used this example in my resource roundup where I say like, you know, these are like really great resources, things that you should be aware of. It's super clear, super nicely laid out. And you can, if you're listening to the podcast and you're like, well, where can I see it? You can go to juro.com and then click at the bottom uh, of their website where you can see privacy Click on that and you're going to get up this. Usually when you click this link, you would expect to see to be assaulted by a wall of text. And what we did is that we're like, okay, there's been a lot of talking about this uh, layered approach to disclosure. So what would that look like? So what we used here, this design pattern that we used was this sort of short form, long form. So when you click, you're just welcomed by this model, basically a screen full worth of information that is your privacy as a glance. It tells you just the very key things in bullet points. So what types of data we collect and how we use them and who are the third parties. We use cookies and when and how we collect data. And there's actually a nice visual, a timeline that explains chronologically the data that people voluntarily give or the data that is collected automatically through analytics and a summary of the rights. And then of course there's a, okay, read the full policy. This is not the full policy, too good to be true, but uh, no legalese we promise. And then uh, we tried to behaviorally nudge people into really drilling down to the full policy. So next to each of those uh, summaries, like type of data we collect, tell me why how we use your data, how exactly. So instead of putting this, uh, try it, uh, read more, read more, read more, we tried to mm, you know, simulate the voice of the user. Like what are the things that people legitimately would want to know? So now we're hooked, we go to the full policy mm -hmm. and this is how it looks. A pet peeve of mine is that uh, in those documents that have a hyperlink table of content at the very beginning, usually they put it at the very beginning, so when you scroll it, you lose it. It becomes immediately virtually useless. So something that I've immediately made very clear, like we need a float menu. All the table of contents staying there <laughs> fixed. So wherever you are in the privacy policy, if you get a question, you want to jump somewhere else, you have the tool to do it. Second thing, going back to the layered approach, we decided to, to have this sort of accordion approach, meaning that uh, we're just going to put the heading together with an icon and the very top layer of information, sort of the most general, most crucial information visible. And then there's a button called read more. And then you can open and drill down to the details. And these details could be, you know, just something a little bit more legalistic or extra information. For example, you know, here in the how and why we use your data, we are mentioning the legal basis for Uncle Joe on the street, what the hell is a legal base? They don't know, but if they click on that or on the tags of the legal basis or they click the read more, there's a description of what actually, what are these legal bases? And by the way, you can change your mind. This is how you do it exactly. And contract means this, legitimate interest. This is what our legitimate interests are instead of just playing the, the blanket card of, yeah, yeah, everything is legitimately interested. We're a business here. Richard and the team were very specific, like th these are the things we do. 
Something else that we got very good feedback on is that usually the, the privacy rights are buried, I don't know, second last <laughs> section in the privacy policy. And we decided to bring it much, much earlier. I think it's the fourth, fifth section here. So the rights are given upfront before talking about, you know, security or how we store your data or retention policies and third parties and these sort of things that are getting increasingly more technical. We're going to talk about your rights. So if you are not cool with that, you know, what you can do. Something else we did here, of course, there was the timeline. So visualizing things that are inherently described better in ways that are not prose, for example, process time, parallel processes. If you look at all these uh, touch points where data is collected, we try to put them in a chronological order. So to mirror the, user, the actual user or potential customer experience. So you browse any page, you may request a demo, we call you, you use Juro, you receive email from us, give you an signed contract and so on, all these sort of things. So another pattern that we use, for example, in the third parties, so the process your data or cookie is if you want to be very precise, it can be overwhelming. So we decided to use this very structured table categorized, so for example, by third parties for infrastructure, third parties for analytics, and so on. We put the name, we put the link to their own privacy policy, and very clearly we spelled out what data is shared with them or collected by them on our behalf, for what purpose, what's the place of processing. So if you scroll, it's quite a bit of stuff, and uh, I notice in other projects, if your uh, data environment is very, very complex, uh, for example, you're the, a railway operator or uh, a telecom, you, you may have like a million of different channels. So perhaps you're not even able to be so detailed in the technologies you use. But if you're a single, you know, you're a service provider, just see, uh, focus on one product like Juro, you're intimately knowing your tech, you can be actually quite precise in your disclosure. And the same thing with cookies. I mean, we have the names here of the cookies and the purpose and Gosh. what they're used for. And to do this, mm. you, you can only do it if you have a highly collaborative team on the other side, <laughs> because you need to involve the technical people. You need to have whoever is doing this process with you to really go and be a researcher and investigate. What are we really doing? What are we really using? And why are we really using it? So. It's a little bit more than, okay, let's just put a privacy notice on our website. These people really assess the data they need. They probably did their own data assessment and sort of things. You need to have within the company that you're working with this joined up thinking, I guess, so that they are all working together to present you with the information. And then you've presented it so nicely because it's a lot of information, but I love how you've done it in that it's not all presented at once. It's really a pleasure to read. Yeah, and even the information architecture, I mean, I'm talking about collaboration. This was really an iterative process. The, the CEO of Juro is a lawyer by, by background. So he told me when he sent me the text along, he said, like, well, I already asked our external counsel to draft it in plain language. So the starting point was much better than many other projects, to be honest. And still, between me, Richard, so the CEO slash uh, lawyer, their external counsel and their head of content, we bounced back and forth this document 21 times. If I remember correctly, it was 21 iterations on like, no, it should say like this. No, this thing should go first. No, this is where we put the accordion. So just figuring out really the information architecture and what it says and how it says it. I haven't really written this text, but I've been asking the question like, okay, you're saying that you're doing this how and when. And so I've been putting my researcher, nitpicky researcher hat on and asking, so can we give an example? How are we going to do this? Oh, this, this word is, feels a little bit like this. Even if, if it was a design sprint, we managed to run a few user interviews, like five user interviews, but by no means a big sample. By all means, much bigger sample than mostly this sort of documents <laughs> receive. And we still made some changes, for example, in the icons, we had like different alternatives and we would make people just click like, okay, answer as fast as possible, which of these three icons you would put with this word. So we even tested the association to find the, these companion icons based on the feedback, for example, that's why we brought the privacy 
choices much higher and we changed some things, how they were explained. There was a really uh, very good insight to make it more relevant for the real customers. And so you've spoken a little bit about the, like, the process behind it. So you were contacted by them just at the end of your maternity leave. Uh, oh, no, in the middle of it. I was three months old. I was oh. stopping every three hours to breastfeed. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it sounds like, you know, it was an exciting thing to do. Yes, because I haven't tackled the privacy policy yet. And I like that attitude. They were like, yeah, let's go wild. So I was like, mm, I think I don't want to wait another, you know, maternity leaves are pretty long in film. And like, oh, I really want to do it. So my husband is a good Finnish husband, feminist husband, <laughs> help with the baby. Those days I've, I've been doing this design spring. That's perfect. That's so great. So you mentioned the CEO, Richard, maybe. He had kind of, or within Juro, they had drafted the privacy policy already in plain English. So you were dealing with already a kind of more user-friendly document than, than is the norm, I guess. What was the process then? Like, how did you get to this? Well, in most of my process, it's really like this sort of like getting to know very well the content, starting asking a million of questions from the business owners, and then getting started with the information architecture. I was having this discussion on LinkedIn the other day. Dennis Potemkin, who was a guest on your uh, podcast already, was saying contract design is not just doing visuals and say, yeah, actually, if we should look by allocation of time, contract design is information architecture or content strategy. I mean, most of my time, especially in very long, very messy document, you're spending days and days and days and days just to figure out what is the right place for this stuff. Is all the stuff under the right heading? Is this the right heading? Do we have enough subheadings to guide the readers? This thing is too vague. This thing is too detailed. Like the flow of the story needs to make sense. And to me, it's horrifying when I open some contracts and I see that for many lawyers, it's just enough that the, a clause is somewhere. It really looks like sometimes they're just chucking them in without looking where they're copy pasting it. You know, it's like, why is it under this heading? I don't think you know what that heading means because <laughs> it mm -hmm. definitely shouldn't be there. So there's all this stuff all in the wrong place all in the wrong drawer or in the wrong bucket somehow. So first you, you, you need to put it in shape. Once you put it in shape, then you can start polishing the language. Like, okay, how's the tone? How do we chunk it down and so on? And after you've worked a lot on this layering and information architecture and, uh, and language. So when the, what, what it says starts to be reasonable, you can say, okay, how, how do we say it? How this thing is going to look like? Form follows function. So part of the function comes from the users, what, what they're trying to do and from what the organization is trying to achieve, but then the information is what it is. So what type of information we have there and what is the, the right way, what is the most efficient, clear, supportive, engaging way, whatever the goal is, whatever the task that people need to achieve with this information is. What is it that we're trying to do? So what is the right design to achieve that goal? So it comes later. And actually, when you've been doing the whole conceptualization, it, it becomes easier. This sort of design and a couple of different others, you know, it just takes perhaps a couple of days to do it, at least the static one. Probably mm -hmm. the, the development team to do the front-end development took another couple of days. But, you know, designing the concept, finding icons, it can be quite quick. These icons are from a standard collection. If you're trying to design all of this bespoke, okay, that is going to take time, but there are ways to go a little bit faster. Like the colours, for example. So in the Juro pri privacy policy, listeners, if you're not seeing it, Stefani has used colours, like boxes with colours, and so those colors, did you choose them or do you kind of consult with the client and together you, you work together to kind of find out a color palette? You, you need to match to the brand. I mean, contracts are a customer touch point. They should be aligned with the brand. So in my project, the first thing I, I do, I mean, I write it in the proposal, like customer responsibility, 
give us your design assets and your brand visual brand manual or if you have anything about tone of voice even that so you, you need to give us your brand manual because this thing if you put it on a table together with a leaflet or a presentation or you look at it within a certain website this experience needs to be seamless and when you deliver the work do you actually do it inside their website like do you go into the back end I don't know. No, 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 no. For example, for this project, I collaborate with their front-end developers. So you just give them the mock-up, the prototype, instructions. If you're working with, with web, it's always good. It's always best to rely or, and collaborate with the front-end developers because mm-hmm. they know where to put their hands under mm-hmm. the hood and how to integrate this thing. That's a, a, a nice collaborative way of working. And... You mentioned, so a lot of what you were doing was really like like the architecture of where everything was fitting. Do you think that you're, because you're not a lawyer, do you think that that actually helps you to kind of see things from a different perspective? Well, definitely. I think that everyone's background, how we look at the world I don't think what I'm doing is rocket science, really. Some lawyers are very good writers. It's just that sometimes when you're creating these documents that, I mean, you cannot do it on a transactional basis. I, I wouldn't be able to do it on a transactional basis. I mean, contract design, if you look at the life cycle of a contract, should really be among the strategic activities like, okay, how are we going to deploy analytics? Or what is the overall contract strategy? How do we determine the objectives and the design? So designing the templates, designing the tool, it should be there. It should be completely decoupled from the, from the rat race. You can't design something to, to this detail if you're having a customer waiting for your proposal or your contract and you have to send it yesterday. You have to design upfront or in a parallel R&D process the tools, the templates, the editable stuff, the modules, all the things that when you're switching to the transactional mode, you can patch together something that looks like this. I'm really glad that you mentioned this. If this was a, a, a contract for two businesses going together, it would be really hard to produce this from scratch because, of course, lawyers are working very quickly. They need to get the contract out. You can't just have a bespoke beautifully, legally, nice designed (laughs) contract for every single client. There are ways to go about it. I mean, I can imagine some super gigantic law firm could have some design interns to help with this. But anyway, you need to try to do more with less. Either you are an in-house department or you're a law firm. You need to create your design patterns, your uh, half-baked solution that you can then tinker and redeploy very quickly. Even law firms, they have their closed libraries. They are copy-pasting stuff and putting together the documents because they, they, they're, not scra- they're not starting from a, from a blank page. And that should be the same approach with design, is the same approach that you use for interfaces or when you have a design system and you are creating a whole digital environment, ever-growing digital environment uh, on your platform. You Mm. have to have all those assets and you have to be able to create new things very, very quickly on the basis of those assets. So when you're creating those closed libraries, make sure that there's no crap in it and start adding visuals and start giving stuff their own correct headings and create some, even if you were working in Word, create some template that doesn't look obscene. Do it once. And it's going to pay off many, many times over. So where can we find good examples of design contract templates, Stefania? Templates? If you ask me, you are out of luck. But if we're talking about design patterns... I've used the wrong terminology. No, I'm, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there because I do get that question. So what is a design pattern? The design pattern is really a concept that comes from design or so- and software development. A design pattern is basically a repeatable solution to a commonly occurring problem. This can be a bit of code. It can be a design asset for a, you know, a digital system. But you can do it for contracts too. So a repeatable solution to commonly occurring usability and understandability problems in contracts. So by no means, this is all visual. 
there are different categories of design patterns. Some are purely about information architecture, some are about language, some are about visual, some are about uh, tone of voice. So it's basically a big taxonomy of some of the things you can do. In addition to, you know, go and read Ken Adams' manual and get a training in plain language, these are the other things you can do when you're designing documents to make them less crummy. So listeners, if you're not seeing the video, we're looking now at the contract design pattern library by the World Commerce and Contracting and which Stefania co-founded with Helena Harpio. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. And if you look on YouTube for the videos, you'll be able to see as well. So Stefania, I've talked a little bit about this in previous podcast episodes. You've mentioned like what a pattern is. So it's something that can be used repeatedly. Yeah. So it's not something that you can copy paste a pattern. Mm -hmm. Uh, I like to use the metaphor that it's like those Dr. Oetker cakes. You know, Mm -hmm. you're buying the kids. There's the dry ingredients. That's the pattern. But to make a cake, you can't just toss that in the oven. You have to add the milk and fruit and eggs. You need to add the fresh ingredients. And those fresh ingredients are your contextual knowledge from someone working in a corporation or someone working from a client and who has done their their homework and has extracted that contextual knowledge from their client. And you have to add that to the patterns to get your user-friendly, better communication in contracts. So uh, a design pattern is basically organized like this. I'm going to come back to this page, but it's basically organized like this. It's a principle-driven description. It's like, what is it? What problem does it solve? When to use it? Why using it? And where to use it? So there's first this principle-driven description, and then a, a very important part of a design pattern is the practical examples. So the description are quite short, but the idea is that the more real life examples you find, the more you start putting in your library. It is contract design patterns or uh, your coding patterns or anything, but you start basically documenting all the instances that emerge from real practice to put it there and be like, okay, this thing has been used for this purpose by these people uh, and put a picture or put an example, put something that uh, if it's code, you can put something that can be copy pasted. With this case, no, because, you know, it's not only how you say it, but it's also what it says. Uh, and that's why I'm saying, like, it's very different from templates. And even people say, why don't you put something that I can easily download and copy paste? Like, no, we, uh, we are sorry. We are never going to put something like that in this pattern library. Because we're not going to put templates or ready solution intended to be copy pasted. Because we don't know your context. Because we don't know... We don't know what is the right thing for you. I mean, you have to make your own strategic choices. We cannot give you a Ferrari to drive in a two meters wide road. You're, you're going to crash. It's not the right context. That's what, what I'm trying to say. So it's that the users, when you go into the pattern library, you see lots of different patterns and then you can click into them and get this information about kind of like how would you use this and why and a bit of information and then you can click through to go to see examples of these being used in real life situations. You cannot download a template to, you know, copy and paste into your own contracts because as Stefania said, not every pattern is going to be correct for you, your firm, your clients. So it's kind of a a place to see really good contract design to inspire you. And the important thing is that we're documenting what those problems are. I think that when you're engaging with the design pattern library, the idea is that you start absorbing that mental model. You start to recognize what are those typical information problems in contract. So you can prevent and solve them. Okay, I'm, I'm having here a very... I don't know, I have a process of some kind, okay? Is it a linear process or is it a po- process with different outcomes? Okay, it's a linear process. It's a timeline. Is it a process with multiple outcomes? It's a flow chart. I mean, y- you already know where you're going there. You still need to create the flow chart uh, or the timeline and put all the things right and make sure that it's clear. 
but you know in what lake to go to fish, <laughs> so to mm. speak. Or, okay, I have a document with uh, 25 exhibits. Mm, perhaps having prominent section starts or some sort of color coding would be good. Or, oh, this thing is for uh, consumers. Mm, perhaps a conversational style, you know, you and us or uh, small close summaries then may be good. Or, oh, we have a goods delivery. So defining what delivery is is very important and we're using perhaps incoterm oh perhaps then a delivery diagram is very important so it is about absorbing this way of thinking about information to adapt it so it becomes almost like second nature the beginning is a little bit difficult because people come and say like, what should i use in a in a ipr clause or what is the right pattern for a liability clause like now and ask the question what's the communication problem like not what it's called. What is it that you're trying to communicate? What's the nature of the communication problem there? Why are people not understanding? What are we trying to do there? Do they need an example? Is it something that, you know, you need emphasis to take it out from the wall of text? Is it something that is substantially difficult? So you need an explanatory sort of, I don't know, diagram or whatever it is. Is the problem of tone of voice that you're, you know, your counterparty feels threatened or feels that you're a bully or feels that you're stuffy or whatever it is, or is it just that you have the right stuff, but they are thrown around haphazardly and it's a mess. So <laughs> what is the problem? Or do you have just too much information and then do you have just to layer it? And if you can see here, well, for those who are watching the video, everything is organized in families and everything is tagged. So if you just hover, go over these tags, there's like small explanation of what they are. This is the way to start uh, to try to help you learning this way of thinking. You can also click on those. We have here the pattern families. So you can explore and we are saying, okay, pattern family is a family that does such and such. And visual patterns is stuff that works like this and helps you with this sort of problems. So when you Basically, going and having a read of the what are these pattern families. They're all organized like this. It basically tells you with what problems it helps you. What is the problem you tackle? Because then you can say, okay, under this big umbrella, under this big um, family, okay, I can choose this pattern or this pattern or this pattern or this pattern because they're all relatives and they can work better or not as good depending on the context and you know how to choose them there. There is an overview here, and then there's the families. You can open them here from the menu or under here, or while you're exploring the library, whenever you click on those tags, it sends you here and you can read the, the full explanations. That's great. I love that overview of the pattern families because then you've got a really quick overview of the pattern families. So for example, emphasis, giving visual prominence to crucial information so that users don't miss it. You could then go and click on that and... Here they're already pre-filtered. So you can say, okay, what do we have tagged with emphasis? Okay, icons, both the companion and the icon system or the prominent section starts, uh, highlights, stuff like that. So then that's going to give you some ideas like, okay, we need to emphasize some certain information in our contract or really show users the important points. And this gives you ideas of how to do that. So the highlights, you can highlight information, you can give icons to pay more attention to those clauses. So it's just a really nice way to just change up your contracts from simply a wall of text in quite simple ways, but simple and, and very effective ways. Yeah, here in the highlights, actually, we are having just one example, but it's one example on steroids because there's, if you notice, there's like different ways to do the emphasis. Instead of having the shouty all caps, this is a liability clause. This is a little bit different way. There is a tag that is like warning you with an icon that says warning, so like read this. There are uh, bold uh, keywords there is a background. I mean, I'm fighting all the time with American lawyers that uh, say like, it must be all caps. They're like, no, this should be conspicuous. It can be bold. It just needs to be differentiated. 
Mm-hmm. All caps is not written anywhere. Ditch it. You're shouty. It's horrible. No one can read it. And use punctuation and use space. There are paragraphs there, usually those very long. Like, don't just make a block of text. There are so much more sophisticated and much more uh, effective ways to give emphasis than just the shouty, all caps. That's what we were using with typewriters. That's why they were using that, the all caps. But we are not using typewriters anymore. There's many other things you can do with a word so processor. Much. And so these examples, they work really, really well, like on the computer. What about off the computer? Like, I suppose there's, you know, slightly different things that you can do. Most of, actually, if you explore the library, most of the examples are for uh, static documents. So like PDFs, Word document printable. It's just a coincidence now that we looked at Juro and now there's uh, excerpts from the bad sumo terms. Okay, this is from uh, Sales of Goods. So for those who can see it, this is a maxi timeline of a factory acceptance test plus a site acceptance test. So this is a, a equipment sales and is explaining step by step okay, how you're going to test it and how much time between different phases and what happens if you botch the test or uh, the customer approves it and so on. So simple timelines like these. Like this one from the Shell Marine Lubricant Terms. Uh, you can use timelines even. Uh, That's also the point that you, you don't need to necessarily use them in contracts, but you can use them to strategize. This is an example from uh, Miriam Ross and Deepika Jayakoda's book, The Innovation Matrix, where they use some design patterns to explain the IPR strategy that they were explaining. So basically, you can use these to think, okay, what is our IPR allocation strategy and so on. This is an example from Sarah, Sarah Fox, from a construction contract. So all the different time frames and different phases and who does what. And so this is another pretty sophisticated timeline. She worked with a professional information designer, Robert Hemsel, to do this one. It's very, very nice. Here's our mm-hmm. Juro. This is something created at the Novo Nordisk. So... Gina Shar is someone working in the legal department at Novo Nordisk, and she's been a supporter of visualization and so on. She said, well, I don't have the budget for a designer. I mean, I'm going to do it anyway. It doesn't matter. I'm going to figure out a way to do it. So she's been starting little by little to create these visuals and add them up to their contracts. And yeah, perhaps it's not the best design tool, but you can do it with Word and PowerPoint. If you really want to do it, they started changing a little bit their templates and adding colors and simple timelines. Yeah, you're not going to win an information design award, uh, perhaps, but this does the work. This is exactly what everyone should be doing. It's something that everyone with the basic um, computer literacy skills can do. It takes me so much more time when I work in PowerPoint because a client asks me something editable than when I work, I don't know, in Illustrator, in design, like actual design tools. I honestly understand and empathize with that hurdle. because I have ideas very clearly. I'm a professional designer and still I'm there like, why aren't you doing what I want? And it's so fiddly and all the presets always give you systematically the wrong suggestions about what you should be doing with your visuals. Mm. It's very frustrating. So I can imagine that someone that perhaps doesn't have very clear ideas and then there are all these junk presets is going to send you down the wrong path and you're going to struggle a little bit to really find something that is neat. But uh, my recommendation is honestly, sketch it on paper first. Get your ideas clear and then tame Office 365. (laughs) Then you figure out, I mean, you can find a million tutorial about everything and a million uh, half-baked visual templates about, I don't know, timelines and stuff like this online, to Mm. be honest. But you need to have the clear ideas, not just, okay, I I download this tutorial or I download this uh, PowerPoint template because it looks cool, and then you try to force your information into this thing that looks cool but doesn't work at all for your information. Pick a pen, piece of paper, sketch it, sketch it again. Probably you have to give it a couple of rounds, and then you're going to have something that makes sense then you figure out how to tame Word and how to implement it. I, I swear it's going to be much, much easier if you go down that way. Okay, so now let's look at another example. 
this example, IT 2018 instructions. Can you explain, first of all, what exactly is this? IT 2018 is a set of uh, standard terms created by the technology industries of Finland. It's just this cross-industry organization and the Chamber of Commerce and many other partners, the Association of Procurers and Buyers and stuff like that. And, And they decided to create this family of terms, one general terms and then nine special terms for the IT sector so that especially SMEs would have these standard terms. They would just buy the license for this nice little booklet, and then they could use these terms in a self-service way, basically, because someone would have already have drafted, you know, terms for selling off-the-shelf software or, I don't know, hardware or software development project, waterfall project development with agile consultancy, all these different categories that there are in IT. So there are these 10 different terms that you, IT nerd, (laughs) turned entrepreneur, need to choose from, and you don't have a clue how to choose them. So what they do is that they give them with an instruction. The instructions had a problem too, (laughs) that they were still too legalistic for the business and technical people, especially from SMEs. The user said that they really didn't see the point. Like, what was the decision to be made in terms of contract based on business decision? And at the same time, these weren't uh, detailed enough for lawyers. So when you can pay a lawyer to help you with these terms, they have books to tell you how to really fix them. So that basically, these users didn't really know how to make their choices and avoid the mistakes. So that whole unique selling proposition of, okay, you almost don't need a lawyer to make your simple contracts. It wasn't really working. So we had to redesign these instructions. We didn't actually redesign the terms, but that's the thing. That sometimes, even if you work in-house, you may want to redesign uh, interfaces to contracts. So for training or simply like contract guides or handover guides. And so how did we discover the user needs? So how did we shift from contract drafting to contract design well, first, we had a pilot. We just took the terms for the agile software development and we made a prototype. Then we had a workshop with the experts and then we revised it. And with that, we went back to the board. They said, okay, we like what you're doing. Now you can do it on all the instructions. And when we could finally do it on the old instructions, I went out and I started interviewing people from the software industry. And I said, okay, now I'm going to interview some people that do consultancy, some people that do cloud, some people that do waterfalls, some people that do this. So basically all people that had experience with the different categories of business. And I don't know, I had 15, 20 hours of user interviews with these people. They were very opinionated. They really know very well their business, very seasoned entrepreneurs, very good in what they were doing. So I started to really really listen, okay, I was a bit desperate because what these people were telling me and what I had there on the closest were really different. But well, we found a way. We also had the feedback from the board of experts. So it was an iterative process once again. And basically between interviews, we would always change a little bit the prototype and then go back to the next interview. So there was always something fresh. What kind of questions did you ask the entrepreneurs? It was basically trying to ask them first, like, what are the questions that you're asking when you're selling this sort of project or when you're buying this sort of project? What are the things that, that, that you need to communicate? Well, what are the things that uh, are difficult to negotiate? What are the things mm. that give you problems? So I try to underst- really start from the business first, because it, that was the feedback that they didn't see the link between their lived experience and these terms. So among the other problems, they're like, well, I've been using that, but I've never read the, you know, we don't want to read legal stuff. I know that I can use that. If I just have a way to make a right choice, I'll do that. So at least in the instruction, we said, okay, the instruction shouldn't read like the terms because this is not the contract. So there were stuff like it is meant to be used. Just say use. The party that needs to, like, no, you, because you're talking to the user of whoever is drafting, just tell them you. It is recommended that the parties verify that, like, check that. And so there was this sort of reframing of the tone of voice and the instructions instead of looking like a Word document. We tried to make it looking a little bit more like an instruction manual, especially this, you know, this 
this family of terms is very modular. So to me, it was really like, I started immediately thinking like, how do you mix and match these terms? So I want to speak with the entrepreneur to understand like, what are the real type of projects from simplest to most complex? Do you ever mix and match this sort of things so just to discover these things? So another problem is like, oh, there are too many terms, all with similar names because, you know, there's always these three letters like EAP, ETP, EVT, acronyms in Finnish. And they were saying, well, well it would be nice to change the names, but if they don't want to change the names, at least how do I choose the right ones? So basically we created this decision tree, like if the, if the object of delivery is consulting, cloud services, software development, or actually software, uh, ready-made software, or uh, software to be developed through Agile, through Waterfall. Is the deal containing maintenance? Oh, yes, then add also this one. Or here in the red, is it uh, hardware? And is there maintenance of hardware? And then are, are you handling um, personal data? Okay, then slap this one on. And then you always have to use the general terms. So pick one of the special or more than one special. We're going to see later how do we pick more than one special. If you're a personal data processor, also add these and then always put the general ones. There are problems that information was not presented from the perspective of the user. So actually this is a project I, I did with Helena. We tried to really, once again, we worked a lot on information architecture. <laughs> And based on those interviews, we came up with a, with a structure for this document that was completely different. So there was the part on the general guidance. And okay, start from the business need, then draft the contract. These are where all different chapters. How to reference clearly, because these are external documents, how you attach them, how you give a other party a chance to review. Order of application, how do you pay attention to those sort of things? And then when you went to the guidance, like, of each of those 10 terms, once again, there was a series of questions, how you draft the content, how you patch it together, and then pay attention to these topics. So how you customize them, because you can always overwrite them in the execution document that sits on top, basically. And once again, that are chronological structure, exactly like Juro. This is what you need to do chronologically when you're drafting a contract. <laughs> This is the first page of one of those uh, special terms. They all look like this. There's going to be a different icon, different name, but basically there's always this section that says, when do you use such and such? And these icons, you use it for this. If you're in this situation, don't use it. If you're in this situation, use these ones instead. And this was all modeled on those mistakes and misunderstandings that came out from the user interviews. People use the consultancy terms to do this sort of stuff. Like, no, for this stuff, use this. For this stuff, use that. So basically, really trying to understand the mental model and where that mental model breaks and try to, to intercept them before they make the mistake. And here, once again, a uh, small instruction about, okay, th this is the contract structure. If you're using these terms, you have to have your template. Um, you, you can download a, a general template, or you can use whatever you already have of your own. Special terms always together with the general terms, and then all the other attachments that you need to put. I mentioned before that how do you choose the right mix of terms in more complex deliveries? The solution was these decision tables. So for example, let's take a consulting agreement. It can be pure consulting. So you're doing a requirement scoping or a series of workshops to decide what you're even going to build. You can use just consultancy. Let's say you're doing that part of consultancy, but then you already know that it's going to fit into a waterfall development model. You use the pink ones. <laughs> if you're going to develop with agile, no, you use the other one, use the green one. So basically we, we put all this sort of mix and match depending on scenarios. And once again, all the scenarios is stuff that I managed to extract from the interviews. It's stuff that I was really asking feedback from the entrepreneurs like, okay, you've been using those terms. How does it go? Can you mix it with this? Is it likely? Can you mix it with that? Is it likely? So I was basically probing them to figure out like realistically, what are the type of deliveries these guys are having? To prevent mistakes, just tell people what to do. So for example, we, we put these boxes with model language. If you want, you just copy paste this language. Like if you want to modify the delay penalties stated under clause, blah, blah, blah. You just do like this. And here is the language you can copy paste. Or if you want to reference this and this, you can do it like this or like this. 
So it's a no-brainer. You don't have to figure out how to do it right. This is something that Helena drafted. Trust Helena, just copy paste the language that Helena drafted for you, basically. And same things like preventing mistakes in the referencing, but also in the order of application, like what goes first, especially when you put the data processing addendum. I mean, you can always agree that it's something else, but if you go with the default rules, it's going to be this sort of thing. And it's a bit complex because you have the data processing agreement, its attachments, then the terms for the data processing that come from this family, then whatever contract, then the addition, then the special terms, and then the general terms. It starts getting a little bit complex. (laughs) And these were the the famous questions to think about. So it was hard for them to contextualize the terms in real life. So here there was like, according to the different business, like, okay, does the solution contain also standard software? Do you want a solution only with standard software or also with uh, open source? Like all these questions that basically speaking with experts, like, like, okay, how do you price? How do you decide what even the contract should cover? Basically, these are the questions to help you figure out what, what is really the scope and what are all those topics that may affect, for example, IPR or anything in terms of delivery or rights or who does what, or affecting the price, or, okay, should I actually add also the terms for maintenance and upkeeping? So basically, those were all the questions to help them figure out what is it that they need. So the letters, these are like the sets of terms, is that correct? Yeah, in in each set of terms, they would start with this sort of page, then there were other pages and... uh, Yeah, you can see it here. This is the first page. This is the second page. Mm -hmm. Here is like start from the business needs. Here Mm -hmm. it explains what is that type of business. And here there were the questions to think about. Mm -hmm. Then the second section is uh, draft your contracts. It tells you where you can get some uh, empty template. You you can draft it by yourself. Or here there are some uh, templates that the publisher of these terms makes available for free. Uh, This is how you choose them. So the questions, what's the purpose of those questions? It's for them to think about it because before even drafting the contract, you need to think about what is it that you're selling or buying. We're not telling you what to write in your contract, but whatever you write in your contract, you should think about these things. Something that is very difficult in contract drafting is always writing the scope. Actually, there's more uh, claims and disputes on the scope than on the legal terms very often. So this is something that the terms don't really cover by themselves, but it's something that serves the entrepreneur when they're drafting the, the cover letter or execution agreement or whatever document you're going to attach the standard terms to. Even though it's in Finnish, <laughs> I, I can see from the documents that you were presenting, it already looks way more easy to read and to follow than, you know, if I'm just seeing like loads of text, like that decision tree going through, guiding the user through is just really helpful, especially because people can get intimidated by legal terminology. And so using this, I I, I guess this is written in a much clearer way and then using visuals is just way nicer for people. Yeah, people were saying like, there's like 10 of them, all with different colors. I, I know that I'm always going to use the light green one because I know that light green one is agile, <laughs> for example. Yeah, for example, those questions about like, is this delivery then including software maintenance or stuff like that? They were always this sort of balloon. So, so apart from that table, it, this is the table that I showed before. Like, for example, if there is the maintenance, remember to slap on also this, go and read this other instruction. Are you dealing with uh, personal data? In here, there were also examples like, okay, personal data can even mean just this and this and this and this, and processing can even mean just saving them on your seat. And was this presented as like a PDF document, or how was it presented? Yeah, this was a PDF document. It was uh, basically when you're buying these uh, this terms, uh, you get the PDFs of all of these, and you get also these instructions. Mm. There's potential to 
kind of take the questions that you're asking and the decision trees and have it as a platform where you can click through those questions. That was one of the ideas that we have. So you, you could help select the terms, but we didn't have that. That was beyond our remit, so to speak. <laughs> Some of the IT entrepreneurs suggested, like, why can't you do it as a, as a website? So we don't need the PDF. We're just going to Google, you know, like instruction, agile, and, you know, it's just better for SEO and stuff like that. So that was another mismatch. These are IT entrepreneurs. So why the hell are we giving them a PDF? The PDF makes it easier for, for the drafters, but it doesn't make it easier for the intended consumer. But once again, that was a little bit beyond the scope of our remit. <laughs> this was an experiment. We started with the PDF just to figure out if the text would work or so on. But this idea, so that uh, terms chooser, it's something that came out from the interviews. It's something that the users would, would have liked. So some sort of a um, simple contract drafter almost, like patching those things together for them. Yeah, maybe that will be IT 2022. Yeah, instead of the, selling the terms, you sell like, you know, the contract platform, like generate your contract right, right now. I don't know. Yes. Finland IT Contract Association. Contract the robot. Yes, something like that. <laughs> Good. Okay. My final question is, what steps can listeners take now to improve their contract design? So I'm a little bit biased, but I encourage you to visit the contract design pattern library. So contract design dot worldcc.com and uh, get some inspiration, read through the materials, read through some of the introductory parts to get some, you know, just your creative juices uh, going. As I mentioned before, I'm very prototype biased. So I think that you need to start experimenting. There's no other way to learn to do it than experimenting with real problems. You cannot theorize this stuff figure it out completely before putting your hands down. You need to start working it and asking those questions and trying to figure out in context how, how it works. I would suggest start from small pilots. You don't need to overhaul all of your contract at once. You can just start experimenting with some simple patterns. You can just start from improving the information architecture <laughs> and the headings of your contracts. Start from the language, start from, if you're a lawyer, start from the things that you're a little bit more familiar with. So going from uh, writing, good writing to information architecture, that should be pretty close. You don't need to visualize anything. Start sketching, start prototyping. What I was saying before, the easiest way to get ideas, don't start trying to make your redesign starting from Word. Start from a piece of paper, start from a printed draft of your contract. Cut it up with the scissors, tape it back together, make a small, you know, like a storyboard with all the pages and how things should go. Map out the content. That's actually a nice pattern. Incidentally, here, it's called a contract document map. So map what you have right now existing and try to figure out how else that structure could be. So you can do a before and after, uh, playing a little bit with puzzle. And then start asking questions. So there's a nice checklist of questions like to get you going. So questions about your contract users, questions about the business needs and goals and questions about the information. And, you know, they're very common sense questions, but like who are your contract users inside and outside of your organization? And what is it that they need to know with this contract? What are they trying to accomplish? What is their job? What are their tasks? What are the typical mistakes they make? What are the typical questions or complaints they have? What are their typical concerns? What are the things that every time you go into negotiation, it's going to come back to you? Like, if you don't know those things, go out and make it your job to discover them. Because this is where you start to make a good contract to improve them. So figure out the purpose, figure out what you're trying to achieve, figure out for whom this thing needs to work. And of course, yeah, your end users may have an idea of what they want to know, but you as an organization, you may want to also, okay, what do you need people to know? For example, compliance things or things that they, they don't care about, but 
you want them to know and what values do you want to communicate about your organization? What kind of relationship do you want to build? Is it transactional, like arm's length? Is it something for the long run? If you're thinking about risk, what is it that you're trying to control or mitigate? Different organization may have different risks. What are problems, practical operational problems that you're trying to prevent? And then when you take a good, long, hard look at the information you're trying to communicate, Okay, is it information that is just intrinsically difficult? So even if you write it simple, it's something that you really need to think like, okay, this, this concept is difficult. Or is it difficult because it's written like crap? If it's written like crap, rewrite it. And when you find those parts of information that are intrinsically difficult, because you can find those in contracts, not everything is, uh, is simple. So, some information is difficult. Then think long and hard, how are you going to, make it as clear as possible, to explain it, to frame it in a way that people are, ah, okay, it goes like this. So even if they need to do that mental gymnastics, you help them do it. And you make sure that they don't fall in the traps. They avoid those typical mistakes or misunderstanding. And, you know, if you have a lot of information, I know that lawyers are are saying, what old information is important? No, you have to really ask and be honest what is really crucial and what is you could consider extra detail. Because human brain works, you know, is not a sponge that takes in everything. It's more like a flashlight. You're paying attention to something at the expense of everything else. That's how our head works. There's no way around it. So if you want that something uh, goes through and is under that spotlight, m- make sure that you put the important things in a, in a way that you're increasing the chances that people are going to pay attention to those. You know, it is always a risk assessment. Of course, you want everyone to read all the details, but it's not going to happen. So there's all this question of, about information. Are you describing time, numbers, processes, sequences of events? Because there are better ways to describe that type of data than just prose. Stuff that is very easy in a diagram may be very foggy in a, if you try to really spell it out through prose. So my encouragement is to experiment. We built this pattern library exactly as the base camp to start your journey. Start experimenting, see what other people are doing, uh, get examples, get your thinking going. And then have fun uh, cracking this hard nut <laughs> and this contract design. <laughs> Good advice. So when I'm teaching legal English face to face, we do like practical activities of like cutting things up, drawing, like people love doing that. And it also gets you in that creative mindset. So I think that's a really important point that you made is like, you know, get away from your computer and actually get a pen and paper, look at the contract design pattern library, look at those questions that are on that kind of starter page, think through them and start brainstorming on a piece of paper and thinking about how you can actually write the information differently and present it differently. Those are the the kind of first steps that you can take today. You know, some lawyers can be quite, well, (laughs) lawyers are like generally risk averse people. So it could be a, a difficult thing for some lawyers to do. But if you're thinking from the perspective of your clients and how they can read this information better it's not a risk (laughs) giving your clients nicer presented contracts easier to read clearer to read which hopefully ultimately will lead to better business relationships and better deals and less litigation lawyers like to think in in terms of risk like okay let's avoid risk by being very very precise by making things ironclad putting all the dots in the eye striking all the t's and and stuff like that but uh complexity itself adds risks because you risk contradicting yourself you risk making things muddy you risk making things impossible for the people who actually in real life need to act upon that to perform that contract you make it impossible for them to do it to spot mistakes, to monitor the contract. So it should always be a a balancing act. You know, does it cost you more to accept, you know, higher liability cap and close the negotiation today? Are you going to negotiate that close for six months? And how much is going to cost you 
in negotiation time, those six months, plus the delayed time to market for a risk that perhaps, what are the chances? If the chances are very low, you're losing real money today and you're actually ending up losing more money for sure today than protecting against those risks. So mm. if you're making just a quick decision tree and making a couple of calculation, you notice that, okay, let's just agree on this thing today. So risk management is, is relative. You need to think strategically and tactically. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Good. So thank you, Stefania. Lovely to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So that's the end of the interview. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. I hope you're going to go and get your pen, paper and scissors and start getting creative with some legal design now. Don't forget to check out Stefania's website. Go to www.stefaniapassera.com. Check out the contract design pattern library at www.contract-design.worldcc.com. And connect with Stefania on Twitter. Her Twitter handle is at Stewie Key. That's S-T-E-W-I-E-K-E-E. And uh, you can also find her on LinkedIn. Just search for Stefania Passera. Don't forget my question. How do you use legal design in your work? Or maybe you don't. Maybe now you're going to start. What are you going to do? Let me know. So thanks for listening and see you next time.